The other day I was watching uh, the news and I saw a clip from Van Jones. And he was saying that if you raise the issue of corruption, political corruption in the city of Philadelphia, it's racism. Because Philly is a black city. I didn't know we had black and white cities in this country, but I guess we do. And if you look at the demographics, one could describe Philadelphia as a uh, black city. There are more African-Americans than there are white people. Most of the city, 58% of the city, consists of minorities. But this is just the typical leftist effort to silence discussion, to silence questioning. You call it racism, and then nobody can talk about it. And it's really downright absurd. I'm from Philadelphia. I was born there. I was raised there. I lived there just under half my life. And I know there was political corruption in Philadelphia. I know that firsthand experience, experience in my father, experience in my grandfather. I would never connect, attribute political corruption in Philadelphia to African-Americans. If there's political corruption in a black city today, Philadelphia, it's not because of African-Americans. It's because they inherited a system from white Democrats, from white liberals, from white progressives that was politically corrupt. And that's what I want to talk about in this video, because the idea that we can't talk about corruption in Philadelphia because it's a black city is just total BS. Now, I wanted to keep this, you know, first or secondhand father and grandfather in this discussion. I don't want to get into what I've read or what I've heard or third, fourth, fifth hand accounts. And I just want to talk about things that I personally know about and, and are, I believe, actually happened. I saw happen. Some of them happened to me. And there's so many of them. There's actually too many of them for me to go into in this video. I tried recording this video last evening. and I had gone so long. I don't know exactly how long I went. My A6400 overheated and froze up, and shut down. That's how much I had. So what I decided to do in this video is to keep it shorter and just look at basically, I'm going to try to get through four things in this video and leave it at that. And if there's enough interest, maybe I'll do a, a, vi a second video of all the other things that, that I couldn't get. Through. Okay. The first thing I want to talk about is what we could call the tale of Mr. Pink. And if hopefully a lot of you have seen the Reservoir Dogs, and you'll know what I'm referring to with colors here. I don't want to talk about the guy's actual name. But it was 1968. I was 16 years old. I'm working at a center city, multi-level valet parking garage. Now, that's a story of corruption itself. I shouldn't have been able to work there until I was 18. Why could I work there when I was 16? Because my father got me the job. Why did my father get me the job? Because my father was already working there part time. Why was my father working there part-time? Because he had been a traffic cop and he knew the people there. What did that have to do with anything that's a corruption? It's because the traffic cops in the city of Philadelphia had deals with the parking companies to not shoo away the cars when the traffic backed up in the mornings during the rush. And they received favors. Let's just put it that way. I don't want to go into too much detail. It's my dad. I feel bad about it. He's deceased. But anyway, I'm working there. I'm 16 years old. And uh, it's a very uh, diverse environment. Uh, let's say my nickname when I started there was Whitey or the kid, usually Whitey. Why did they call me Whitey? Because <laughs> many days I worked, I was one of a few white people there. I didn't work just with African-Americans. I worked for African-Americans. My immediate, my manager, the big manager there was, was also African-American. And that continued as long as I worked at that place. But anyway, I'm 16 years old. It's 1968, working, I think it was over the, the Christmas break from high school. I'm still in high school. And in comes this big Lincoln Continental Town car. And these were huge in 1968. And I go over and I put the ticket on the car and I go to hand the driver the ticket. And he says, get out of here, kid. Yeah, you don't know who I am. You know, go away, go away. You know, I don't get a ticket. So our, one of the managers, you know, hustles over and he says, uh, Michael, just, you know, he doesn't get a ticket. This is Mr. Mr. Pink. We'll call him Mr. Pink. And just pull Mr. Pink's car out of the way, put it over there. He won't be here long. Do what I'm told. Move the car. Take the ticket back. I go upstairs, park another car, I come downstairs, and there's Mr. Pink. And he's just sitting by his car. And he's got this thug with him, this guy who has no neck, and he's, you know, he's muscles all over the place. Even under his jacket, you could see them. 
And Mr. Pink himself, how can I describe him? He it, imagine zero Mostel, at least six feet tall. Big cigar hanging out of his mouth. So I go up and down again, and there's Mr. Pink leaning up against his uh, Lincoln Town car. And there's one of the guys I work with, my black co-workers, and he's giving Mr. Pink money. I said, oh, what's this about? Uh, I take another car up, I come down, I come down. It's another African-American co-worker giving Mr. Pink money. So now I'm like, what's going on? So I come down, another African-American co-worker, a guy named Archie, whom I knew and was pretty friendly with, he's giving him money. So later on, when things calm down, I go over and I ask Archie what's going on. Now, in those days, when I worked there, two o'clock on Fridays, we got paid cash in brown envelopes with literally, you know, all your money in it that you made. And Mr. Pink would always come at three o'clock, right on schedule, right after pay. So I asked Archie, what goes on with him? And he said, oh, he's Shylock. I said, Shylock? Now, I knew who Shylock was. We read The Merchant of Vincent Venice in high school. Shakespeare. I said, what do you mean Shylock? He's, he's like, it's anti-Semitism? Mr. Pink's Jewish? Which I think he was. I, well, he was. I know he was. Is that what this is about? Why, why are they giving him money? What's this? You know, I, I don't understand. I'm a 16-year-old kid from a private Catholic high school living in, you know, going to school in suburban Philadelphia. And he said, he's a, he's a shark. And I'm like, what's a shark? I mean, I don't know anything. And he's like, oh, man, you know, loan shark. So I, I didn't even know what that was. Never heard the term before. He said, well, he, you know, like, like he usually he'll loan you out money. You have to borrow at least $100. And then one Friday and next Friday, you give him 120 I said, like, 20% interest in one week? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, I discussed this with my father. He explained loan sharking to me and how it all worked. And this went on and on and on. And then one day, I'm home, I'm watching television, and on comes the mayor. And the mayor is, I think it was James Tate. I can't remember which one it was. I'm pretty sure it was him. And he's announcing some big building project in Philadelphia. They're going to, you know, renovate the downtown area and have this big thing. And he's there with all the, uh, not all, but many of the, the uh, senior people in the Building Trades Council. The Building Trades Council were, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the big contractors and the heads of the union. So all these different people get up and speak after the mayor. And up pops, at the podium, Mr. Pink. I was like, what? That's Mr. Pink. And I'm home. I'm in there by myself. My mother's, my father's not home yet. My mother was in the kitchen. And underneath it says, Treasurer, Iron Workers Union. And I'm like, holy yes. You know, Mr. Pink is the treasurer of a major labor union in Philadelphia. Now, my father, by this point, had transferred from traffic to what was called the labor squad, labor relations squad, and he dealt with the unions and the contractors all across the city. So my father gets home. I ask him, I said, you know, Dad, you know Mr. Pink? Yeah, he's a loan shark. Yeah. I said, I just saw him on TV. I said, he said, yeah, you did? I said, yeah. He's, do you know he's the treasurer of the Iron Workers Union? He said, yeah. I said, the treasurer of the Iron Workers Union is a loan shark in Center City? He said, yeah, they've got from, you know, this street in the east to this street in the west and this street in the north to this street in the south. Carpenters Union, they've got this area. And, you know, the uh, boilermakers are over here. And he's telling me how the city's divided up for loan sharking uh, by the labor unions in the city. And my father's on the labor squad. He's a policeman. So I said to him, well, you know that these labor unions are all loan sharking around the city? He said, yeah. I said, well, why, does, why don't they arrest them? You know, I'm, yeah, I'm 16. I'm, I'm, you know, totally naive. And he said, well, he said, what for? We just, you know, we'd all get demoted or lose our jobs or sent to some godforsaken district somewhere. And they just walk anyway. So I said, are you, what are you telling me? Are you telling me that the, the city politicians know this is going on? He said, of course. Where do you think they get their money from? And, and basically, the way it worked is the, 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 the treasurers or people working for the treasurers, go out and loan shark. Now they got cash coming in. It's, it's off the books. There's no record of it. What do they do with the cash? Well, some of it goes in their own pockets. Some of it goes into, you know, other lieutenants' pockets in the, in the union. And the rest, they kick up to the politicians who are getting this untraceable cash that they can do whatever they're going to do with it. You know, 
buy a car for their daughter, buy a house for their son, help them start a business. There's all kinds of ways to finagle this. So that basically in the city of Philadelphia, this is 1968. This is a white city at this point, run by white Democrat politicians. They know the labor unions are all loan sharking and they're just looking the other way. And the police know all about it and it goes on. Now you may think I'm crazy. Maybe, maybe, maybe Mike's just giving us bull crap here. Go look at the Philly papers for 2014 and 2015, and you'll see that the Boilermakers Union, I mean the Iron Workers Union, the same union I'm talking about here, Mr. Pink's Union, they were all busted, and they're all, they're, a bunch of them are in federal prison for doing that and other things that were illegal. They weren't busted by the city. They weren't busted by the state. They were busted by the feds. And the things they were busted for, I knew they were doing in 1968, which is, what's that, 50... 52 years ago? So, so when somebody says to me, you know, is Philadelphia corrupt? Is there political corruption in Philadelphia? You damn straight there is. And I know about it. I saw it. I mean, I watched. Every Friday, I would watch the treasurer of the Iron Workers Union come in and loan shark. And all the people who was loan sharking were poor African Americans who'd moved up from the South, and some of them hadn't even got past the eighth grade. They're the people who were being victimized by these people. And to me, this was just disgusting. You know, the Democrats, oh, we're all for the black people. And they're just ripping them off at 20% interest for one week. Tale two. We'll call this one the tale of Mike's scholarship. I graduated high school in May 1969. It was, wasn't, maybe it was a week after graduation. My father comes up to me and says, you know anything about senatorial scholarships? I said, no. Not a thing. He said, well, apparently each state senator, these aren't the federal senators. These are the, the state assembly senators. They can all give out, I think it was two, maybe it was three, I don't know, a couple of half scholarships to students, competitive process, who go to state universities. I was going to Temple, which is classified in Pennsylvania as a state school. So he said, uh, I said, do I need to apply? Do I need to go somewhere and fill out some paperwork? He said, no, I just need, I need your last report card from high school. I'd graduated, so I had it. And a copy of your acceptance letter from Temple, which I also had. So I went up to my room. I found them. I knew about where they were. Got them in you know, three minutes. Handed them to them. You know, two days later, I've got a senatorial scholarship. Half scholarship, four years, Temple University. Never applied for it. Never asked for it. I said, Dad, you know, how did I get the scholarship? So, uh, I've known the guy for a while, you know, blah, 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 blah. I said, all right. So anyway, I was down Temple at one point. I had to do something. It was orientation. I had to go down with orientation. So while I had a break, I went over to the library and I started going through books on uh, Pennsylvania. So I found the senator who had signed the letter. He was indeed a state senator. The thing was, I looked at his district. I didn't even live in his district. His district covered, I think, parts of Bucks County and elements of Philadelphia, but not where I lived. So, so I've got this state senator who is giving me a, a half scholarship with no application, and I'm not even living in his district. So I said, oh, Jesus, you know, <laughs> Dad, <laughs> well, I'm going to say, no, I don't want this, you know. So I took it, and all the fall came, and, you know, that was fine. And then on New Year's Eve uh, that year, my freshman year, I turned 18. So there were two things I wanted to do. Well, one I had to do, I had to register for selective service, which I did. The other thing was they had amended the Constitution, 18-year-olds could vote. I was now 18. I wanted to vote. This is great. They amended the Constitution just for me. You know, Mike Palmer is going to go over there and he's going to vote the first election he can vote for. So I go there and I have to fill out my registration and I have to pick a party. I said, oh, geez, you know, what do I do? Uh, I don't like the Democrats. I mean, I like the Democrats. I consider myself a Democrat, but the, they were running this guy at the time, Frank Rizzo, who was former police chief, the Cisco kid. And he, you know, from my political perspective at the time, I considered him a fascist. And the Republican candidate, I think it was Thatcher Longstreth, somebody like this, a guy with a bow tie, was some sort of nerd. And the Republicans, to me, you know, Richard Nixon was president, 1968, he'd been elected. Nixon was a fascist. So I, I, didn't, I didn't like Rizzo. I didn't like Nixon. So what do I do? So I register as an independent. No problem, right? I won't go through the whole episode of what happened when I did that. But within a matter of days after registering as an independent, I lost my scholarship. They yanked my scholarship on me. 
I think I think I had it for the spring because they'd already paid the tuition for the spring. But basically, my uh, sophomore, junior, and senior years now, I've got to pay twice the amount that I was expected to pay before. Which for me, because I didn't have a lot of money and my parents didn't have a lot of money, this was a life-changing experience. Now, I can't really complain a lot from a personal level. I mean, I lost it because of political corruption, but I had gotten it because of political corruption. But that's my point. Political corruption. Philadelphia area, eastern Pennsylvania. This is, is uh, we're, we're in uh, 1970 now. And, you know, firsthand experience. 1969, 1970, with my, with my scholarship, I've witnessed firsthand, uh, personally, political corruption. My third tale, the tale of the non-secret ballot. And I think this is going to be the last one because I'm already running low and I'll, I'm unfortunately going to have to skip the fourth one. If there's a lot of interest in this video, I'll do another one. I finally get to vote. This is my first election. Unfortunately, it was a mayor's election. I think it was in May. I, I could be wrong. I want to vote. I've just gotten the right to vote. I want to vote. I'm determined to vote. But who do I vote for? You know, Frank Rizzo? Democrat? Yeah. Thatcher Longstreth? A Republican? Ugh. So what do I do? I don't want to, I could not vote or leave it blank, but I said, no, I'm going to vote. So I make the decision to vote for a socialist worker party candidate. I figure there's no way in hell socialist workers are going to take over the city. So I, but at least I can say I voted. I feel like I voted. I, I exercised my political rights. I voted in the mayor's election. The first elective election I had a chance to vote in and damn it, I'm voting. So I vote uh, SWP. Maybe a month later, I'm over in New Jersey in a club, a nightclub, drinking with a friend who's also our precinct captain, Democrat precinct captain, the precinct in Philadelphia where I lived. And we're talking and like out of the blue, he says to me, eh, you know, Heat, Heat was my nickname, my friend, Heat, you really a socialist? And I said, where'd that come from? What's this all about? Am I really a socialist? He said, well, you know, you voted for the Socialist Worker Party. I said, what? He said, uh, mayor's election, you voted for the Socialist Worker Party candidate. I said, how do you know that? It's supposed to be a secret ballot. He said, oh, you know, that's part of my job. I have to check. I said, check what? How people vote. I said, you're kidding me. He said, no, you know, you work for the city, you got to vote Democrat. You know, at least local elections. So I have to go down. I got my list and I have you know, people. I have to check all the ballots and make sure that the right people voted, voted for Democrats. I'm like, you know, I, at this point, I'm blown away. You know, they know how we vote. When I went in and I pulled the lever, it's not a secret ballot. So the next day, I see my father. Now, my father's a cop. I knew he'd voted for Nixon in 68. So I said to him, you know, so-and-so told me that when you vote, they know how you vote. They can check your ballot. He said, yeah, I know that. I said, well, aren't you worried? You voted for Nixon. He said, they don't care about the national elections. All they care about is the city, municipal elections, county elections. You got to vote straight Democratic or else, you know, you're going to get in trouble. I said, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, at, at this point, I'm just, I'm just blown away. Now, now this is going to, I'm going to end here with the, this third instance. But, you know, you look at these three things, you know, the, the ballots weren't secret. They know how you voted. You know, I got, I got my scholarship corruption. I lost my scholarship because of corruption. And then, you know, I, I witnessed every Friday the treasurer of a major city union loan sharking to African-Americans and taking advantage of them. And at this point, you know, I'm not saying this is the only reason I moved away from the Democrat Party. But these are several of the reasons because, you know, people see, you know, think of the Democratic Party, the party of, 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 of Roosevelt, of Wilson, of, of uh, JFK, you know, of, of uh, Lieberman, of, uh, you know, all these other great Democrat political leaders. You know, my experience with the Democrat Party is abject corruption, you know, screwing people, taking advantage of people. You know, this was to me, this wasn't a party of ideas. This was a party grasping on to power and using political corruption to keep and maintain it. I mean, my father was a policeman. He got the job 
actually when the Republicans were in charge because his uncle was a policeman. Later on, he was in traffic and then he got promoted to a, a cushy job with the labor squad. I mean, traffic was brutal and you worked all kinds of strange shifts. Uh, but labor squad, you worked Monday through Friday in a suit. You know, you still had your snub nose 38 instead of your service revolver. But he got that because he knew somebody who was in charge of the special squads for political connections. And when there was a new regime came in in Philadelphia back in the 70s, and that guy lost his job, my father was transferred out to somewhere else and went on disability and basically into retirement. But so, so my whole, you know, my whole period of growing up from the time I was 16 till I left there, I left Philly, I was like 32, 1983, which was the year before the first African-American was elected mayor of the city. So this has nothing to do with, you know, black Democrats who are corrupt. This is, we're talking here about white Democrats who are corrupt. This has nothing to do with race. This has nothing to do with Philadelphia being a black city. But when I hear people say, you know, Philadelphia is political corruption, you know, there are stories about this. There's not stories about this. I saw it. You know, I, I know my, my ballots were not secret. They told me that. They knew how I voted. And the guy told me he knew how I voted. I know how I got that scholarship. I know how I lost that scholarship. You know, I, I watched Mr. Pink in action. It is a corrupt city. So when I hear stories today about what might be going on in Philadelphia, pff, yeah, what else is new? That's about all I have to say about it. And if there's enough interest in this video, I've got more stories. Like I said, I had so many stories. I went so long last night that the camera froze up on me, overheated and froze up. Oh, you like this video? You want to hear more stories? Let me know in a comment. Now give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, hit the notification button. You'll know when I post new videos, share it with your friends. And until the next time, keep fighting.